Welcome to Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan, a podcast about the art and hobby of miniature painting. I'm Mike. Thank you for joining us as we open a new chapter in our painting journey. This is the first episode of a mini-series I'm calling A Mini Painter in Headlights, Gundam Style. Sorry, I was only able to fit two bad jokes into the title. I'll do better next time. Before I get into the actual episode, a little housekeeping's in order. First, originally we were going to release an interview with John McAvoy of Master Mini Works that included a discussion of an upcoming Kickstarter for their Studio X carrying case. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 concerns, they made the difficult decision of postponing the campaign. After talking with John, we decided that it was best to hold the interview for now and let things calm down around the world and see where things go. The neat thing is that we are going to do another interview with him about commission painting, and I would like to delve a little bit deeper into the fact that both he and his wife are in the hobby. You know, here at the podcast, we are very interested in each individual's journeys um, on how they learn to become better, braver, and happier painters. And so this is kind of cool that you have a couple that paints together. Second, if you haven't noticed already, we have a brand new logo. I hope everyone's seen it by now. Thanks to Victoria Butler of VIU Creative for all the hard work she put in. It's pretty awesome. Finally, this time is kind of tough. The world seems to be moving more and more towards a lockdown. People are fearful of illness, leaving their jobs, feeding their families, paying their bills, finding toilet paper. There is a lot of gloom and doom out there right now, and we're told that we need to practice social distancing, and this could last for a little while. There's no other way to spin it. This is a tough time, and it sucks. Adepticon was canceled. Artists who were doing tours after the show had had to cancel their plans because they can't even get into the country. It's pretty rough out there right now. The good thing, though, is that we have this hobby, and I'm really looking forward to trying to become a better and braver, happier painter. By trying some new techniques during this time period, I'm also going to make sure that I have everything prepped uh, moving forward for the Capital Palette, which is in September this year. Hopefully, that'll still be a go. Um, and so, the, my, uh, you know, here at the podcast, we hope everybody is healthy safe and that they're able to find something to do you have the hobby so pick up a brush pick up an airbrush do something even if you can't get in the mood to paint try doing some basing work read a color theory book etc keep the hobby wheels going and hopefully we'll all get through this sooner rather than later best of luck i hope everybody is healthy and stays safe now on with the episode if you remember a few weeks ago at the richmond international plastic modeler society I talked about wanting to try my hand at Gundam after judging a couple of the categories and speaking with Nick from Macho Models, and that's Models with a Z, and Joel from the Cutting Back Cot podcast. At the show, I purchased a $10 kit from Hangar 18 based out of North Carolina. So before I get into anything more about that, I'm going to give a little bit of a brief description for those of you who aren't that familiar with Gundam out there. I know prior to the show and even after the show, I had to do some research on the whole thing. I knew it was a battle suit in Japanese animation etc. So I kind of had a little bit of a background and I knew the models were cool to look at, but I didn't know much about anything else with it. So from the Gundam wiki page, it pulled that it's a Japanese science fiction uh, franchise. It's created by Yoshiyuki Tomino and Sunrise, and it features giant robots that are also called Mecha with the name Gundam, and that's originally the title of the, of the first series, and it began in 1979. That I did not know. It also, is, there are also almost 40-ish kind of series, between series and movies, there's, I mean, there's a ton of Gundam media out there. It also makes up 90% of the Japanese character plastic model market, which is crazy when you consider other things like Transformers are out there. There's so many different versions of robots, and so you have Manzinger and things along those lines, that Gundam makes up 90% of that market. In 2014, the Gundam franchise reached 80 billion yen a year. And also 18.4 billion of which was in retail sales of just toys and hobby items. In 2018, it was considered one of the top 15 highest grossing media franchises of all time, estimated to have generated more than $20 billion in total revenue. That is just an insanity. I never knew how big kind of the Gundams are. And basically, it's Gundam plastic model kits that they're designed to also be toys. They're basically toys you put together. You don't have to necessarily paint them. Uh, they come in colored plastic, so when you put them together, they kind of look nice already to begin with. So if you're not into painting and such, and you just want toys or something to put on your desk really quickly at work for a talking piece, Gundam are kind of a great idea. But I have to tell you, I never realized how big 
Gundam was. And again, that information I got was from the Gundam wiki page. The kit I bought was, now bear with me, admit me, it's a long name. It's the RGM 79D GM Cold District Type. The first episode, uh, the, this first episode will be about unboxing it and putting it together. Nothing, you know, really too in, in detail. We'll have pictures supporting us on our Instagram and Facebook page, both listening to Paint Dry. After opening the box, there were two white, one dark gray, and one black rubber, as well as a multicolored sprue, which included a translucent green part on the sprue as well, which is very cool. Cool. I've never seen multicolored sprue before. I'm used to just stacks of plastic gray. Now, remember, the original design of these toys was to be good to go once you put it together, meaning no paint was necessary. While the manufacturing side of that hasn't changed, the hobby side of that, hobby and collecting side certainly has. With incredible paint jobs, there are people who do scribing, which is basically uh, chiseling into the plastic to make more panel lines and designs, etc. So it's kind of crazy. If you want to really check out what professional Gundams look like, I, I suggest looking up on either YouTube or doing a Google image, image search of the Gundam uh, Builders World Cup. That is something else. It's, it's a whole different world out there. It'll blow your mind. So after researching the process of putting a Gundam together, I found out a difference between mini painters and kind of model, model builders and Gundam builders. Gundam builders typically don't use super glue. If they glue at all, it is with plastic cement, and there are specific ways that they use a plastic cement to help Scene line, help them deal with scene lines down the road. Now, we'll talk more specifically about that in the next episode, which will be preparation. For this episode, all I did was do a fit of the plastics together to see what they look like. And again, that's on our Instagram at Listening to Paint Dry. When I first took all the pieces off of the sprue and looked at the instructions, which were in Japanese, but that's okay. You can visually you can visually put the pieces together, and the numbers are the same, so that's not an issue. There's no you may not be able to, if you don't read Japanese, you're not going to be able to read the instructions, the language of the instructions, but you certainly will be able to easily follow along. What I noticed was there are very, very few mold lines. The only ones I could find were on the hands and the other items from the dark gray plastic sprue. That was awesome. And I was like, wait, if Gundam can do these, and this is a $10 kit, Games Workshop, uh, Malifaux, all those other mini makers out there, cool mini or not. Um, why, why aren't we getting rid of those mold lines in the production process? Hmm. You know, the, the nubs on it were a bit rough and I had to actually do that work when, uh, that I normally would reserve for prepping, um, a model, and, but that's okay. You know, nubs, you, you cut them off the sprue, you got to cut it and then sand it to make it look nice. So you'll see that what the put together piece has nubs removed. I didn't worry about doing mold lines yet because that was, that'll be part of the prep and it'll just be on the hands. All in all. The build was pretty easy. I would have to say it wasn't that complicated. There were a lot of smaller pieces uh, that go together to build a big piece. For example, like the arm winds up being quite a few pieces, but it really it makes sense the way it's put together. The rubber sprue that's in there it makes up all the joints and the connections, except for ball joints. Wherever there's a ball joint, there's a hard plastic ball joint and a rubber connecting point. So that wasn't too bad. It was, it was pretty easy to do. It wasn't really a challenge to put together. Uh, I hate modeling, uh, and I'm trying to get more in into modeling, so that was a nice way to ease me into that. A few things that bummed me out, though, were first that the gun that it comes with doesn't fit properly in the model's hands. Because it has this weird stock on the back of it, it kind of, you have to put it in an angle. It's kind of like if you were, if you're in my age when the, the second generation of G.I. Joe came out and they would have these monster weapons that you wouldn't be able to like put on their arm. You kind of have to put them at an angle in front of them instead of actually making it look like they were holding the weapon properly. You could, I, I can get it to hold it kind of properly with this kind of weird angle of the hand and it's kind of with the arm bunched up. So the scene, you know, it's hard to explain. I'll have to take a picture of it and post it later on. Second, the posing of this model was virtually non-existent. It's basically a statue. Posability in the world of Gundam is super important. You, you want to be able to make the Gundam look like it's dynamic and not just standing there, and that catches judges' eyes, etc. And so that's the, having a lack of a pose makes it difficult. And so, like one of the things that makes it difficult to pose too is that you have a leg piece, then you have a shin guard, or like kind of the like ankle guard, and then the foot. And so, if you extend the foot out and extend the ankle guard at all, you have this huge gap where it's just you could see the ball joint of the foot. And it's kind of like, yeah, that kind of decreases the allure of of the model. But it's a great start. The third thing was that there wasn't a ton of details and as many large planes of open space. 
If I was going to go rogue and do this solely as a mini painter and not try to adapt techniques from Gundam builders, then I would be stoked because there's a lot of room for freehand on this and designs, etc. I even contemplated instead of scribing it to create more panel lines, actually doing the panel lines as freehand, etc. But I'm not sure that would look right. And so, but it would be nice to have a little more detail on the legs, a little more panels to go about, and to kind of give it some more character. So that's kind of overall the kit. It's a great starter kit. It's probably a couple of levels below where I am as far as modeling goes. And the, that's the one thing I didn't go through and I need to talk about are the grades of the model. So I apologize. So one of the things I should have talked about is that there are different grades of Gundams. The kit that I bought is an HG or a high grade. There are a high grade, which is labeled as HG. It's 144, uh, 1 and 144, 144th scale. There's a master grade, which is labeled as MG, makes sense, 1 and 100th scale. A perfect grade, or PG, 1 and 160 scale. Real grade, which are also 144, 1 and 144 scale. And then there's super deformed. The super deformed is chibi style, basically. And so as you go up the grades from high to master to perfect, the quality of the Gundam increases. The cost of the Gundam increases. The way the Gundam is put together becomes more complicated. And so in HG grade, you put the straight Gundam together. As the grades get higher, you also start to build frames, and then the armor goes on the frame of the Gundam, which is kind of a cool concept. Real grade is the same size as HG grade, but they're much more detailed kits. But they won't kill you in the price range as badly as, say, a perfect kit. Like a lot of perfect kits that I looked at online were upwards 200, 200 bucks plus, going all the way up to like $1,000, which is way out of my price range. So, but a, a good real grade kit, which I think is the next type I will try to tackle when I'm done with this, if I do a Gundam again, that is much more in my price range, about 30-ish dollars. So that's not too, too bad. But I just wanted to take a moment and give those grades so people understand. And this is an HG, so it is a lower, it is definitely a lower grade and it's a beginner's, it's very much considered a beginner's model. The character is a grunt. There's a lot of these bodysuits in uh, what you call it. It's their mass manufactured bodysuits in, in the show. So the next part of the series will be the prep work. And I'll try and lay out my vision for a color scheme and base. Spoiler, there are a ton of seam lines in this model and getting rid of them will not be fun. Um, it does take a while to do the standing and such, etc. So, but that's kind of the ne next part of this. So I had a lot of fun putting the Gundam together. I don't typically enjoy modeling. We'll see how I feel when I'm done with all the prep work. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for joining me today. Have you ever done a Gundam before? Let us know at listeningtopaintry at gmail.com. Hell, send us a picture. We'd love to see it. You can also let us know how you're doing. If you have a topic you'd like us to cover or just show us what you're working on, please subscribe to us or follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd love it if you gave us a nice review. We'll be back next week with a full episode. And even though it's really a stressful time, right, it's a great time to pick up a brush or an airbrush to become a better, braver, and happier painter. You have the time. Just do it. Until next time. Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan is a production of LTPTWMD. All rights reserved. No portion of this recording may be used without the express written consent of the host. The music is Death by a Thousand Questions by Springtide. Download from the free music archive on a non-commercial attribution share alike basis. All views and opinions expressed in the show are solely the views and opinions of the person who said them. All celebrity voices, if any, were impersonated and done so poorly.